Welcome, everybody, to the 81st episode of The Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest, David Statman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Nice to talk to you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and actually, so we go back to the Washington, to Washington Heights like 15 years ago, right? At, at least. I try not to think about how far back, but yeah. <laughs> many, many moons ago. Okay. Yeah. So for those less familiar with David Statman, in case you don't go back a decade and a half to Washington Heights, uh, like other people here, he came to cocktails by way of cooking. He's an endlessly experimenting home cook and food writer who uses food science as a path to instill wonder. David also serves as a consultant to restaurants, bar programs, and food media personalities. As novel as ingredients or creative techniques might be, his philosophy is ultimately about the joy of sharing something delicious and inspiring others to get curious and create. But more pertinently to our interests, the reason he is joining us as the featured guest on this episode is because he created and maintains the Kosher Cocktail Enthusiasts Facebook group. So that that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's a lot all at once, but it was a yes. journey to kind of a, right. a path to get there. That's awesome. Um, and for me, I, I've always loved cooking and I've been, always been very experimental and kind of science-based. Um, and I started food writing and, and blogging and consulting to kind of, I mean, the consulting came later, but really to show, I'm a home cook. I'm mm. not professionally trained. I don't work in a restaurant. I don't do catering. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that I do, I've done just from learning from online sources or reading or experimenting. And, and my goal is just to show people if I could do it, that you could do it, even this really out there stuff. And mm -hmm. um, at some point, um, I kind of shifted from cook, not shifted, but got into cocktails mm -hmm. when I started to see cocktails as really an extension of cooking of ex and, and it was like a kid in a candy store, like a whole new world of like <laughs> ingredients and flavors and textures and techniques to, mm. to play around with and explore. Um, and that's how I got into it. Wow. Very neat. And speaking of drinking, do you have anything this evening that you are currently sipping on? So nothing special. I'm visiting family. So a little more limited for what we have here. I'm drinking gin and tonics here. Uh, which Classic. I'm, I, yeah, I can't go wrong with that. And uh, summer, I love spritzes of any kind. So it's not exactly a spritz, but I'll take it. I like the bitter. So I too. What have you got? I too am drinking. Well, I guess sort of on the lighter end, but an, also a gin drink. And this is uh. So this is not well known about me. I think people on the who are used to listening to the show know that I love my beer. I like my whiskey. In as much as I love my bourbon sort of based cocktails, gin cocktails are just. I, I don't think it's well known but I love my gin cocktail. So uh, for those less familiar, this is a white lady. So it's like two ounces of gin, uh, another ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice and another ounce of Cointreau or triple sec. Um, but for this episode, I doubled those. So this will be a good evening. Okay. So to gin. To gin. <laughs> and I, I, remember on your, I remember on your, I think on your YouTube channel, you had years ago, you did a series of like making cocktails. Um, Great memory. Before yes. this was started to be like a whole scene. Great memory. Back in the spring of 2012, when I was still 30 years old, I decided as I was getting into cocktails, I really wanted to, and I was still working on my video skills way back when. And I said, you know what? I really, it wasn't, it was kind of almost like a training. It was like my own training. And I figured, you know yeah. what? You learn best by teaching. So I just decided I would do 30 days of 30 cocktails. 30 cocktails by a 30 year old. So I just did <laughs> right, uh, right. I basically, that I think it was like mostly like six weeks of five cocktails a week. So it was like Sunday through Thursday. Yeah. I would do another cocktail a day. I had a gin week. I had a rum week. It was, it was right. great. So and that's how you learn. By, yeah. You, you have that structure. You, you, yeah. you, you can't take a day off. It's not like, I don't feel like it. It's like, I'm committed. I'm doing this. Right. Although I, you know, that was the very first time I ever experienced having like needing to take a break from alcohol. Like there were days I'm right. like, I know it's Wednesday or Thursday, but like, I just need to be not drinking today. And I was like, but I got another video to make. I got to do it. Right. So, but great. I hear that. Yeah, yeah. No, I do. I also, I think one of the things people are surprised by is that I don't actually drink that much or that often. Mm -hmm. um, I save up, you know, like picture stuff that I post is not necessarily current. It's, you know, I have my <laughs> backlog of stuff to post and I try to space mm -hmm. it out. And, um, but uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not always that interested, but um, you know. <laughs> That makes sense. That makes I get sense. typecast sometimes, but uh, I I think I probably do too. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I imagine. I imagine. 
Yeah. To this topic of this kosher, mm-hmm. was it kosher cocktail enthusiast Facebook group? So let, right. let's go back to the beginning. What is the right. origin story for this group? How did you decide to start it? And what did you have in mind when starting it? Okay. So I was not planning. I never had in mind to, you know, lead a group or start a group or make anything big. I was looking for something uh, because I, I was getting into cocktails and when it, there's a lot out there and there was always more and more out there about cocktails in general and recipes and stuff like that. But you see all these like new, interesting liqueurs or Amara, Amari or stuff like that. But the, the cautious landscape of that is so much different than like, oh, you have okay, supermarket stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, for a number of years, thankfully, there's been the CRC list and, and mm-hmm. uh, other lists also that you could look up and they update their PDF once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, comp- it's pretty good. It's not comprehensive. And then there are more obscure kinds of things that you just don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would find obscure, not just obscure hashgachas and hechsherim, but obscure kosher lists from Argentina, from here, from there. And, <laughs> and is, is this a reliable list? Well, so-and-so in LA who also certifies this says it's okay. And they're <laughs> recognized by so-and-so. So by inference, by chain of whatever, maybe it's okay. All this stuff is very confusing. Um, wow. And so I was looking for more resources on that. Um, and I didn't find, you know, two, there were two things. One was just finding conscious resources. Mm-hmm. And the other was just a like-minded community of people who are interested in cocktails, but, but facing the kosher challenges of that. Yeah. So I started the group. Yeah. What's the time frame? The, I started the group, I think it was around November of 2017. Okay. So it was basically, I guess, that year that you were running into these challenges of Right, trying to confirm yeah. cash root. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, and I I would ask some. You know, there were a couple of people here and there that might know something, but I, you know, there was it was very, uh, it felt like a very lonely kind of place trying to figure this stuff out and very limiting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started the group, and I think like most new ventures, it started off small <laughs> and grew very, 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 very slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point, there was sort of a core group of people with you know, similar interests who somehow found out about it. And also, you know, in the interest of making the group a community, I wasn't looking to like blast all my friends and friends of friends on Facebook Mm -hmm. and say, and join everyone in the group. And now all of a sudden I have 800 members or whatever who don't want to be there. Um, So I Mm -hmm. didn't really advertise it or, or, you know, it just sort of spread organically and people who are interested joined. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also tried to, I still try to screen incoming members because I get a lot of members who come from other sort of general secular non-kosher cocktail groups huh. um, who hmm. don't know about or aren't interested in kosher. And, and if they're going to be posting things, it's just going to be complicated. So I screen, I try to screen people as best I can mm-hmm. to keep the content focused and relevant. Um, and so the, the cautious side of it was one thing. And the other was just the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the community started to grow slowly, but surely. Um, and, uh, and, and, there's a lot in between then and now, but I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful to say now that there is that community that exists um, where, you know, I used to be much more involved on like each post and commenting and responding or, <laughs> or trying to answer people's questions. And now, you know, this is I, none of this food or cocktail stuff is my day job. I do other stuff. Yeah. And so I'm busy sometimes and I'll come back and say, oh, there was a post, you know, four hours ago, but like five, 10 people already answered the question. <laughs> That's amazing. Everyone's kind of helping each other out in that way. That's great. You mentioned, so you, you started off more slowly and when did it really start to pick up as far as both numbers of people in yeah. and also sort of involvement within the group? Um, so I think there were two, two phases. One was just sort of the interest. And, you know, one thing that was really nice was in, I think it was February of 2019. Hmm. Um, so about a year and a half into the group. Um, there used to be a restaurant on the Upper West Side in Manhattan called Boru Boru, which has since closed. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a, a really excellent bar program um, and they knew of the group and, and uh, the owner and uh, the bartender were, were in the group and they decided to host a special cocktail night um, with specially crafted cocktails paired with dishes that it were you know, <laughs> meant to accompany it. It's um, like your sweet and, zone. That's like your sweet yeah. spot, like cocktails and food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. And, um, and with the, the level of craft that we don't usually see in the kosher mm-hmm. cocktail world, which is thankfully is growing. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but still, you know, kosher usually lags 10, 15 years behind (laughs) everything else. And so we're Mm -hmm. catching up in Mm -hmm. terms of craft cocktails. And so they had this event. There were, it was small. It was like six people seated at the bar Mm -hmm. and, uh, they all came from the group, from the online group. And it was great to kind of make it real and and be with people and have that sort of, um, just conviviality and and Mm -hmm. everyone sharing this interest. Um, and, uh, and so it was really, that was like the full, the first realization in terms of making it real and not just online type, 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 click like, but people getting together. Hmm. The second and, and more uh, just in terms of numbers, the increase of the group as, as a sign of the times had to do with COVID and the pandemic. I was going to, you beat me to the punch. I was going to yeah. ask about pandemic. Yeah. And so, as I said, started in November, 2017 mm-hmm. um, and um, reached it. So, our group reached 1,000 members in August of 2020. Mm-hmm. So it took from that time to till that time to reach 1,000. But most, almost half of that 1,000, almost half, I had joined since March of 2020. <laughs> so basically the beginning, the beginning of the pandemic. And mm-hmm. I'm sure there were a lot of different drivers and dynamics behind people's interest in cocktails or joining cocktail groups. And um, you know, people have more time on their hands. They also weren't going out to bars, so they, they were, weren't. Yeah, they wanted cocktails an, to be at home. That's an excellent point. People wanting to kind of self reliant, and I'm going to have to figure this out myself if I want mm-hmm. cocktails, um, and also coping with the stress of things. Um, and that's mm-hmm. been um, mm-hmm. a very delicate balance. Um, and especially in my in my day job, I'm a psychologist, and every day I see the unfortunate outcomes of addiction and substance use. Not that everyone who drinks or you know is going is is, you know, has a problem or, Mm -hmm. or can potentially have a problem, but, um, you know, especially in the early days of the pandemic, there were a lot of, you know, people also use humor, um, to cope with things. And there were a lot of memes going around and and a lot of them kind of glorifying drinking or, Mm. or glorifying drinking as a solution or coping way of dealing with the stresses. And, you know, and, and so my job as in, in, as the administrator of the group, I tried to balance, not to be like a party pooper and say, no one can make any jokes no fun allowed, <laughs> but, um, but to balance that with not glorifying drinking. And so for example, mm. there's one that sticks out in my mind, which was a picture of like a huge, I don't know, it was like a liter and a half of whiskey. And it had like masking tape on it, you know, Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday, and like drinking your way down. <laughs> and to me, wow. I, you know, and so um, I, I guess one of the, the privileges and responsibilities in administering the group is to, um, is to, be mindful of this kind of content and, and what it's going to do. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I do exercise my right to remove content sometimes. And I, I always follow up with the person to explain why. And, and if they want to have a discussion about it, I'm happy to do that. That's great. That's really great. Hello, dear listeners. It's your host, Rabbi Drew. I wanted to break in right now and just say, hey, A, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate or watching however you're consuming this content. And I'm always open for new ideas both for specifically the Jewish Drinking Show, whether it's topics, whether it's guests. I'm also looking for other resources that I can provide you with in the Jewish Drinking Project more broadly. Also, you know, I'd really like to offer you the opportunity to to sponsor this work. If you want to go to patreon.com slash Jewish Drinking, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you have ideas for swag, also, please feel free to send them to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. All right. Thank you so much, L'Chaim. And now back into the episode. And then since August 2020 till let's say July 2021, in the right. subs- and then yeah, where, okay. where, where did it progress to it by then? So yeah, so now we're almost a year since then. We've we've added uh, around 600 more members. So mm. it's slowed down, yeah. um, and uh, so it, you can really kind of uh, correlate that spike with the pandemic. Yeah, that's that's a big yeah. It, it's a big catalyst in a lot of people's lives. Yeah, yeah. So okay, great. All right, so. Let me ask you with this one. I have a bunch of questions. What have been some of the things that have surprised you about this group? So, I know I, I, I will yeah. say, I mean, I know you mentioned you intended it for kosher issues and also for right. creating community, but I'm also curious about surprises. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say that some of the things that were surprising might, should, I shouldn't have been surprised by, um, but maybe it was just kind of being in my, everyone's kind of in their own bubble and now we're getting together. So mm-hmm. one of the things was just um, the level of, of craft, the level of craft that other people are interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and for like the boru boru cocktail night, that was one thing. Um, but in our group now, we, you know, there's some people who are doing also, I think people just kind of home bartenders, home mixers. And, um, you know, we have one person that he's my like rum expert that I always ask him questions and someone else about vermouth. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the other thing related to craft is that maybe I was naive, I don't know, is, is that there are actually quite a number of professionals who either do cocktails for events, you know, for, uh, you know, for an engagement party, for an anniversary, for whatever mm. it is, you know, they'll come in just like you have your caterer, you have your, you know, the person who comes and mixes drinks um, and might mm. create signature drinks for that event. Um, wow. and, and also, again, sign of the times, um, doing in person, but mostly online cocktail workshops um, oh. and, uh, and a number of professionals who, who do that. Um, and, you know, people set up a time and, and they, you know, it works different ways. Sometimes they'll supply the equipment, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, you know, or they'll provide or they'll provide a shopping list, and they teach people, you know, here's how cocktails work: shaken cocktails, stirred cocktails. We're going to mix up this and that, and and everyone's kind of got their approach to it. And so there's um, there's kind of a sub community of these professionals within the group. That's really neat. And yeah. have they been sharing? I haven't. If they have, I haven't been following that mm -hmm. closely. Have they shared, or or at the very least, I guess tip, you know, tips and tricks or maybe a sub community of their own have they yeah so so we actually have a, a whatsapp group that i that uh i didn't start that you mentioned uh our friend avi feingold who started um mm -hmm. and and, um, and and a two-time guest on the show yes yeah i should yes of course um he uh <laughs> there's a quick plug if you haven't show. checked out his episodes on kiddish club or uh wine at jewish life cycle events it's a quick little yeah. plug yeah so he so he does these workshops and he has a very high level of dedication to the craft. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that's been very gratifying in terms of the community, I was looking to start a community, um, is that there's not a lot of drama and competition. People will mm -hmm. post on the group, I'm looking for someone to do an event. And people say, I do this, or I do this. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but behind the scenes, all these people are talking to each other, getting advice, saying, you know, how do you structure things? How do you do this? Or do you have any suggestions for this? Or um, and it's, it's really collaborative rather than competitive. That's really incredible. That's I yeah. mean, it's, it's really wonderful to hear. Yeah. I, I think, that, yeah, I, I'm like one of the things that, well, okay. First of all, Avi Feingold, he's a rabbi. So that's, it's already rare enough. I think for, for people who are typically concerned with kashrut to be into cocktails, I think that's already a rarity amongst people who keep kosher. Let's just say. Right. Yeah. I mean, at least, or at the very least to be interested in sharing these things. And then I think it's rare still for people to be, I would say, actively engaged in the construction of cocktails. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, because of the all this obfuscation and confusion about the kashras, I think there's mm. a high barrier to getting into cocktails. And so oh. someone who might be interested might say, okay, I know about gin and tonic or, you know, and, and the question that comes up a lot that for me, I'm also not very good at it. When I'm going out to, let's say, a, a, a non-kosher setting, a bar, what can I order in a bar? What is mm -hmm. safe to order? You know, what is, and um, this stuff is really confusing. And so I, I think that mm. you're talking about interest. Interest might be separate from kind of knowing how far in I can go or what mm. I can do. Um, and um, so I think that that landscape is changing um, as things become more accessible, certainly with the group, people mm. who are new to this and, and overwhelmed by all this stuff are free to ask questions and get mm. in and get answers from people who understand the kosher world because they're in it. It's I mean, it's like, it's been so many years. Like when I started getting into cocktails, mm over 10 uh 20 in spring of 2012 probably fall of 2011 it is funny now that i'm thinking about it 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 was a dizzying uh, first of all right. discovering what 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 even are in cocktails like what is this cocktail what does right. that have what is this ha like if you just go to a bar and you say oh i just want to this and you don't realize all the different uh, constituent ingredients that go right. into it versus once you start getting into it you realize at least for you know core cocktails or classic mm -hmm. cocktails you might have a better sense Right. Uh, sort of what the kashru concerns might typically be, but you're right for a, a newbie, mm -hmm. it can be a dizzying ray of, of a lot of new information. Yeah. And in, in terms of newbie, that's also kind of the flip side of the craft that I mentioned, because the group is not yeah. for craft cocktails. The group is, I mean, that's what I'm interested in. 
Mm-hmm. And there are others, but the group is for anyone. And so it's for people who are into the craft of it with only the best ingredients and they measure exactly and it's all this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also for people who don't know a lot or their version of cocktails is they, they do a splash of this and a splash of that. And, oh, what if I throw <laughs> this in? And, and it's not balanced, it's whatever, but it's like mm-hmm. everyone as long as they're enjoying or as long as they're interested in learning, like there's a place yeah. for them. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not there to judge. I'm there to, you know, to inform, to educate, to, to do all that stuff. Hey there, hope you've been enjoying this episode so far with David Statman. I hope you've been enjoying. There's still much more of the episode to go, uh, but I actually want to give you a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Professor Rabbi Joel Hecker. And here is a sneak peek. There's another Zohar text that says that you should support it with the left hand. In other words, in opposition to the Rambam. Now, it's not only that, that the Kabbalists like to stick it to the Rambam <laughs> when they had uh, their, their opportunities, and they do. I hope you enjoy that sneak peek into next week's episode. Now, back into this episode with David Statman. Would you say that there are certain trends that you have seen in the group? And, and that can be sort of over time. That could be uh, since the pandemic. I mean, it, any yeah. type of trends that you've seen it in any form or fashion? Yeah, I mean, I think one is these online cocktail workshops, which I mentioned, I'm not going to get into that again. Um, But um, a lot of the trends I think are in response to kosher limitations. So, you know, for me, I started off coming into this thinking about like, oh, this liqueur or that. Um, But actually I've since, as I've gained more of an appreciation for cocktails and how they're structured and vermouth is the biggest issue because in, (laughs) in the United States, the only kosher certified vermouth is Kedem vermouth. Uh, which is all that I've had. And so I don't have anything to compare it to, but I hear from other people that it's not that great. Um, And in in Israel, there's, you know, there are other options, Martini and Rossi, which is available in the United States, not certified kosher. Um, And so people will, you know, kind of bring things from Israel. Um, And so one of the trends- Yes, I think that's a very important note (laughs) is that anybody looking to get kosher vermouth should get that Martini and Rossi in Israel. Although uh, just as a note to listeners, one time we picked, I think I or my wife, someone picked up a bottle of Martini and Rossi in Israel and it had a Hebrew on it. We brought it back and it said, it said, it's not kosher (laughs) in Hebrew, in Hebrew. It said, this isn't kosher, (laughs) which is just so funny. Like what the, so if anybody is buying uh, Martini Rossi vermouth in Israel and just because it has Hebrew on it, doesn't mean it's kosher. (laughs) Right. But yeah, that is, um, I will say, and this is for all listeners, Mm -hmm that is, is far superior over Keta. In terms of trends, one thing that's picked up, a lot of people are making their own vermouth. Mm. Um, and, you know, there are online, there are a number, there's, I'm sure you could find lots of different recipes for, you know, homemade vermouth of different stripes. And, um, and so people are making their own and tinkering with that. Okay, so more, how yeah. difficult, how laborious, how labor intensive is it to make your own vermouth? Um, so it depends on the recipe. So the most, the easiest one, I would say there's, um, um, a bartender in England who, who's behind uh, lioness bar. And he's also very sort of science technical oriented, very out there kind of thinking. And he has a technique for making vermouth in the microwave, um, <laughs> using really? the, the microwave just to infuse. It's a quick mm-hmm. infusion and that's mm-hmm. basically what it is. Um, and so it could be as simple as that. Um, mm-hmm. and also his, his, his recipe does not have these, many obscure ingredients, um, mm-hmm. you know, other recipes might have, there are, you know, the, the bittering agents, um, whether it's wormwood, which is the source of the name vermouth, vermouth, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, other, other herbs or roots or botanicals that you're going to infuse in there. Um, so those might be a little harder or, or, you know, you might, you might be spending, I don't know, $15 to buy a pound of it, but you only need this much of it. And, um, <laughs> so, you know, so, there are really a, a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, and, the, and with vermouth, you know, we're, we just have the one Kedem, but they're really, vermouth is a style and you can make all sorts of different vermouths hmm. within that, you know. You, have you done it? So I haven't. Um, it's oh, one, okay. Again, it's, I do so much, I'm sort of talking around it, but no, I haven't. It's my, okay. my, my, my shameful secret. Um, Maybe that, this will uh, be the catalyst for you to go out <laughs> yeah. and make your own vermouth. Yeah. So I have, I mean, I have all, I've done all sorts of like, you know, these, DIY crazy cooking and other kinds of projects. I mean, my, my, exactly. cocktails, my cocktail stuff that I do, I have like a, a home centrifuge. I've done like these, like all sorts of like, this crazy is totally up your alley. This is, this is up my alley. And, <laughs> uh, and um, 
I guess one thing with the, again, with the pandemic is I've had a lot less time on my hands actually, because my, oh. my job is, uh, has required more of me and I, I'm not going to get into that side mm-hmm. of things. So, um, so I haven't been able to devote as much time as I would love to, cause I love this kind of project stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, but I, I have, um, um, an acquaintance who, who lives near me, who does tinker a lot with this stuff, um, mm. who, um, his name is Yoni Schwartz. Actually, he um, hmm. he did the the Passover beer, the Exodus hopped cider. Oh, I don't know cool. if you saw that. Mm-hmm. So he's he um, so he's a big tinkerer with this stuff. So he made his own mm. vermouth. He gave me some of that, and it was really nice to kind of taste. Like it's it's not Quality as like, vermouth. Yeah, and it's <laughs> and like you taste everything that goes in it. Mm. Um, and so he actually just started um, a, a non alcoholic beverage, a canned beverage called. Um, uh, I'm blanking on it, fresh fizz sodas hmm. where he uses all natural ingredients and, and like really interesting flavors like date, cardamom soda, oh, wow. um, hi- hibiscus ginger. <laughs> and uh, so make a mental note of that, but um, that's really cool. So there, there are, pe- there are people tinkering out there and, uh, and talking to each other in the kosher world. I'm just really impressed that you are as into cocktails as you are. And the only vermouth you've had is Ketam. <laughs> Right, because I, I mean, first of all, Manhattan is just such an incredible drink for me, and then there's, and I've already uh, put it out there. I love my gin, and gin works really well with a dry vermouth. Yeah. So there's really great stuff if you can get your hands on that martini yeah. and Rossi, or it sounds like you've got good access access to a uh, homemade vermouth. So yeah, so I mean, I I will say for me, vermouth again was not one of these things that I was so interested in in the beginning, or I saw it as okay, it's necessary for this. It goes in here. I don't know if I like it that much, um, but I, I started huh. to kind of acquire an appreciation for what it is in itself, especially last summer for me, I got very into spritzes, that kind mm. of Italian style, sparkling, vermouth, mm. some kind of bitters. Um, oh, and, wow. uh, and so now I'm leaning much more toward vermouth, you know, vermouth focused kind of drinks. Mm-hmm. All right. So all this talking about vermouth and, and kashrut mm. constraints leads me yeah. to... Uh, and I know you mentioned at the outset about mm-hmm. various kosher lists. So how much has that been a part of the, I guess, how much has it been part of the group's conversation and also yeah. how much, I, I, and again, I know I've been part of the group, but I haven't mm-hmm. tracked yeah. it on a daily basis exactly. Sure. But for what you have seen, how much has that been part of the discourse? How much has that been part of the conversation? Also, like how much have you seen people helping people with identifying what is and isn't kosher? Yeah. So the, the kosher issues are really underscore the whole fabric of the group when it comes to even what you asked me already, you know, starting the group, what's been surprising about it, all mm-hmm. these things have to do with kosher. Campari is another great example that I, I mm-hmm. really use as kind of the hallmark for this mm-hmm. um, because Campari is something for me, it was like very exotic. And um, I mentioned to you, I had my first taste of Campari imported from Israel where it has a heksher mm-hmm. um, in, uh, at, at a wedding of a mutual friend of ours. And um, at some point a few years ago, I saw, um, I think on Instagram, there was a restaurant um, in Long Island that was serving Campari in a cocktail Hmm. at the restaurant. And I messaged them. I said, how are you doing this? (laughs) Um, Is this, you know, are you importing it, whatever? And they said, no, Mm -hmm. the local VOD approved it. And so the issue with Campari, for those who don't know, um, the the primary issue of, of kosher sensitivity is that originally Campari, it's, it's colored red. It was colored with cochineal, uh, which, which it comes from ground up a certain kind of beetle an insect. Mm. Um, and that's some, it'll say natural food coloring. Mm. Um, and so that's not kosher. And, um, and the one that was made for the Israeli market was made with artificial coloring. Mm. Um, that's kind of some of the background. I'm going to jump back to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, no, let me stop jumping out of order. Let's just uh, stick may, with maybe, the cochineal. <laughs> Yeah. Like maybe like 15, 16 or more years ago, they switched at least for the U S market and almost all worldwide markets of Campari are artificial food coloring, not cochineal. Oh, wow. Um, um, and, um, and so because of, because of that, um, at least this, you know, this restaurant told me that the local VOD approved it to use huh. domestic bought in the U S at the liquor store down the street, um, Campari in their cocktail. Wow. Fast, fast forward a few months. Okay. The VOD rescinded that approval <sighs> as things go. No. The concern okay. being 
well, what if it's leftover Campari, you know, dead stock that had been sitting on shelves? And how do you know? Um, For that long? How long right, did so, they switch over? So 16 years ago, at, at least. <laughs> um, so, I, so a few things. One is there's, first of all, Campari, in general, in, not in the kosher world, beyond, mm-hmm. cocktails have exploded and, and interest mm-hmm. in craft cocktails. And Campari especially is wait, wait, huge. Wait, wait, before you get to Campari. I like, yeah. you know, feeding off of your earlier comment that the kosher yeah. world is like 10, 15 years behind. So it exp- what did you say? 15 years ago it exploded? Give or take. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're catching exactly. up. We're catching exactly. Up. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Yeah. And uh, it's nice to see. Yeah. And so, um, so for Campari, there's, there's so much, first of all, like you said, that was a long time ago. Um, Campari is so popular. Just looking at the, the likelihood is that there's such turnover in stock mm-hmm. in the liquor stores or, you know, or, or their distributors. Um, second of all, you could turn the bottle around and look on the back. It'll either say <laughs> artificial coloring, in which case it's not cochineal, mm-hmm. um, or it'll say natural, which you're not going to see anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, just it, it's not tenable to make that argument. At least that's what I think. And, and so, you know, going back again to your question, what's, surpri- what's been surprising? Mm-hmm. There, there are surface kind of public level conversations, and then there are behind the scenes conversations. And when mm-hmm. people, I talk to people privately, many people I'll use the word admit um, to using products that they won't necessarily admit to publicly because it's not clear that they're hexured or that they're okay, Mm -hmm. but they've done, this is, you know, their own research. The trend is that people are doing their own research. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'll say for me, I Mm -hmm. buy Campari locally in the States. I feel satisfied for Mm -hmm. myself. Everyone's going to make their own decision. Mm -hmm. Um, This, it, it presents, you know, I, in terms of putting stuff out there in public in the group, Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to presume or give my own hashkacha and say Campari is okay. I don't want people, I want people to be aware that this was my personal decision. Um, and so it, it's kind of tricky in terms of how I, let's say I'm just putting up a cocktail recipe. If I'm putting, co- if I'm putting Campari, um, you know, I, I, for a while I was kind of putting an asterisk after Campari and then at the bottom search group for issues related to Campari because I did a whole <laughs> post on this whole thing. Yeah. Um, and then, but there, at some point there was kind of a critical mass of people who use domestic Campari. Um, and hmm. so another complication is that sometimes someone will put in a recipe where they say martini and Rossi vermouth, right? Uh, and they, I, I know that they got it from Israel, but I put a comment mm. in, please just make sure that people know, because someone's going to see that and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and mistakenly assume you could go and buy that. Um, so there are a lot of these types of products. Um, and, uh, and sometimes I surprise myself, like there's, um, there's a, a chili liqueur called Ancho Reyes. Mm-hmm. And I, w- I heard about it. I was very interested in it. I was trying to research, is it kosher? Is it, is it this? Is it that? What's it made of? And on their website, they have a whole dis- description of the process, mm-hmm. which is helpful. And I wasn't sure. And finally, I, w- I saw one in the flesh in a, in a liquor store. I pick it up and on the back, there's an OU. Say, like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> All that, like, wow. So, wow. you know, I try to do my research, but sometimes I stumble over something that was so obvious. Yeah. Um, how, how, how much of that, how, how much of the group is dedicated to sharing? You just mentioned people use their own stuff or the, they'll do their own research. How much of the group is people sharing their own research into the various ingredients or, or potential? And I know you mentioned much earlier right. in the episode <laughs> about people finding obscure uh, kashrut lists from various right. places and sharing that with the list. So how much of that, uh, and I'm just going to throw in, I got to mm-hmm. ask, I did see recently, and it must've been much mm-hmm. earlier about Benedictine. Right. And which I was shocked by. Like I've, I've, I remember before I was, was even into drinking. Um, I, I had heard like the, the, the Chabad Rebbe had been into mm-hmm. drinking Benedictine. And then right. at some point it was, is no longer drinkable. Mm-hmm. Um, so What's the story behind Benedictine? So um, I don't remember all the details, but there's, um, I similarly came across a few years ago, an article, I think it was CRC, Chicago Rabbinical Council, mm-hmm. um, about going through the issues with Benedictine. And as, as I understood it, the conclusion was that it's not, not kosher <laughs> in one of those Talmudic mm-hmm. sort of, yeah. um, you know, well, and uh, you know what, if I can just offer a little, yeah. Uh, defense to kashrut yeah. agencies i mean look they they have sure. certain standards and certain policies and some things they just can't outright say one way or sure. another so that's fair i agree i mean they have yeah. their limitations right um and their their responsibilities um and uh you know mm-hmm. people argue over the the 
the politics of it or how paternalistic it is, how protective they're going to be of our sensibilities <laughs> and our making mistakes. And, right. and it's, it's a hard balance. And I have that yes. as the administrator of my group. Yep. Um, and so, um, but there's been more out there on, on Benedictine too. And, and mm. I'm continually, so people are out there doing their research and discover things or, or will call up, you know, a certifying rabbi or a local mm. rabbi. And, and, um, and so there are a lot of things that I'm surprised to discover. Oh, that was kosher this whole time. I never knew. Huh. Um, and there are people like, for example, there's a woman in Italy. I don't remember her name offhand, but on Instagram, I think she's divine.italy. She organizes kosher travel in Italy and kosher experiences. Hmm. And so she, there's a, there's a, there's a kosher list in Italy of, you know, just like uh, of food products and alcohol products. Um, and wow. so she's shared some of that. And again, sometimes also with the, with the London Beth team, sometimes, mm. you know, there's, they have their list, but a lot of times like their list says, this list applies only to products in England. <laughs> so some people make yeah. the leap and say, well, there are reasons, mm. again, political reasons why they can't speak for the US market, but it also does apply. And people say, no, it doesn't. And yeah. So everyone's going to ultimately decide for themselves. How much uh, other sort of personal research have people shared? And are there other products that you would like to, any particular ones come to mind? I mean, we've already spoken about mm -hmm. Campari and Benedictine, but right. any others that come to mind? So in terms of sharing resources, so um, this guy mentioned Yoni Schwartz. He put together a spreadsheet that is linked on the group. Um, mm. and, um, and other people are talking behind the scenes of, about kind of having a more comprehensive, coherent resource to guide people mm. through this, um, either about, you know, to put to, just to either to compile things like Benedictine or uh, Galliano or mm -hmm. whatever it is. What's Galliano? Galliano is, I don't even, I think it's, I don't even remember. I've never had it, but there's, mm -hmm. and again, there's like Galliano La Authentico, like authentic. That one mm -hmm. is kosher. There's another version of it called Galliano Ristretto, which is not kosher. So, mm -hmm. you know, people have to kind of be mindful of this. And so, mm -hmm. you know, people are looking to put together one sort of comprehensive resource that people can do go to, which might just, mm -hmm. it's sort of like an off-label kosher list, if as it were. Okay. South of the border in Mexico, there's, um, there's a liqueur called Nixta, which is a corn liqueur, um, mm. which also on their, on their website, they go through the process of how it's made. And I've looked at it, N-I-X-T-A, and, um, and I, I'm not a rabbi, I'm not even close to a rabbi, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see any kosher sensitive kosher concerns in terms of how they do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so things like that, that, you know, if someone does their research and I'll, I'll give, sorry, I'll, I'll give another example of something that, that might be misleading. So Luxardo mm -hmm. is a brand yeah. that makes that they have a huge line of products, um, almost all of which are kosher certified and they have versions of Campari. So I, I often, for oh, people really? who are not, for people who are not comfortable buying Campari locally and, and who can get it from Israel, mm -hmm. um, Luxardo has their version of Campari really? um, and, and versions of other things. And yeah. um, so, so there are substitutes and going back to, you know, how people help each other in the group. A lot of times people will ask, you know, here's a spirit that's not kosher. Mm -hmm. I want to make a cocktail that calls for it. What can I use as a substitute? What's mm -hmm. sort of in that vein? David, oh, that's really, that's all that's really fascinating. Is there anything else you would like to add uh, further about the Kosher Cocktail Enthusiast Facebook group, especially coming from you as the founder and, and an administrator of it? Um, yeah. So, you know, there's two things. One, I, I mentioned before about substance use, and that's something that, you know, no one likes to kind of think about that troublesome or sad or, or those kinds of things while we're talking about, you know, people are happy to talk about cocktails and drink. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I uh, try to keep people, keep people mindful of, or, or hope rather that people are mindful of that. Um, you know, someone said to me once talking about this, you know, that he's not really concerned about people abusing cocktails because cocktails <laughs> take a, a lot more time and attention. You're going to, you mix it up. You're using expensive ingredients. You're not chugging mm -hmm. one after the other, after the other. Um, and I think that's true, right? It's not, it's not beer. It's not just downing vodka or just downing tequila or whatever it is. Um, it's very at, true. And at the same time, w anything can be someone's poison. You know, anything mm -hmm. can be someone's undoing and, and, um, and everyone's got their, their limits and things that are going mm -hmm. to interfere with their functioning. Um, yep. And so, uh, so that's something that I have, you know, as a concern just to maintain just for kind of public health um, mm -hmm. And the other thing related, yeah, what were we I, say? I think that's really wonderful. I think that's really great. I also want to use this opportunity as a plug for episode number 48 of the Jewish drinking show about alcoholism in the, in the Jewish community. Excellent. So. Yeah. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing related to, to public health having to do with this sort of uncharted landscape of cocktails. So one of the trends that I'm personally not so into, mm. maybe you've seen dry ice cocktails, right? Because mm. dry, dry okay. ice is, is frozen carbon dioxide. I've solid, seen on Instagram. Right? And when you put it in, in liquid, it sublimates. It doesn't evaporate. It sublimates. It turns back into vapor. And that's what you see, like in spooky movies, you see all the, like the fog. It looks out. amazing that's, on the internet. Right. It looks very cool. And a lot of restaurants and bar programs and uh, people who do events, you know, uh, home events, whatever, catering events, they'll do these dry ice cocktails. There's also, there's also liquid nitrogen. We're not going to get into that. People use that much more, <laughs> much more rarely. Mm -hmm. um, but they're actually quite dangerous um, mm. because, um, and there have been cases, well, I'll say dry ice cocktails are only safe to drink and safe to serve after they've stopped their bubbling and, and smoking, fogging. Um, what happens if someone doesn't? Okay. So if someone is served, if someone drinks it and swallows a piece of dry ice, mm -hmm. this, it's not water ice. It's carbon dioxide ice. It's, I don't remember the temperature. It's much, 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 much colder mm -hmm. than the ice cube in your freezer. Um, it can cause irreparable organ damage. Um, people, there was a case in England, a woman had to have her stomach removed. Um, people have all sorts of, there's all sorts of potential grave dangers associated with it. Wow. Um, and, um, and I think people aren't aware of that. So I try to raise awareness of that issue from the consumer side um, mm. and also of the people serving because it's, you know, cocktails are very much about the visual. And so <laughs> people want to create, you know, memorable, and, and, exciting. And, the, and 10 times that if their cocktails made for Instagram. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's all about the visual. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it's not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a party pooper and throwing a wet blanket on things. When I tell people, you know, your dry ice cocktails, don't serve them until they stop doing all that dramatic stuff. Um, but, um, and so what happens is usually when I see, you know, cause people, businesses, uh, though, or restaurants will be posting these things and I'll message them privately and I'll give them resources. There's a great website for, for all sorts of cocktail safety issues, including different ingredients. And it's called cocktailsafe.org. Um, oh, wow. and, um, and it's, it's always growing and expanding and it provides credible resources for this stuff. Um, and so I'll message them privately and make them aware of it. And either they'll ignore me, um, or they will say, oh yes, we're, thank you for that. We didn't know we're going to, you know, mm. be safe and whatever. And then I see them continuing to do just what they were doing before. Mm. Um, and I'll follow up again. And eventually I, I might call them out publicly on it online, mm. at which point many of them just block me. Um, mm. and, uh, no one ever really changes their practice. Um, they just keep doing what they've been doing. Mm. That said, there are, wow. um, there are professionals there, you know, whether, um, people who do workshops or events or, or things like that, who do not use dry ice. And when people ask them for those cocktails, they say, no, we do not do that. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, there's a, a kosher magazine that wanted to do a, a feature on dry ice cocktails and they asked me really? to write it. And I, I, I declined because I don't want to contribute to popularizing this trend. Hmm. I felt very conflicted about it because I mm -hmm. also thought that would put me in a position at least to kind of provide the information about how to use it safely. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't want really to be involved in that. Um, and so that's an, another thing. And, you know, the thing is when someone is at a restaurant and they're served a dish or they're served a drink, they're there with an assumption that I'm being served something that's safe for me to eat mm. or safe for me to drink. And I've heard people say, well, the, you know, it's some people have made the argument to me that the consumer should be informed and educated. I think that's really too much to ask. I think the assumption is that if you're being served something, it's ready to drink, ready to eat. Yeah. Um, and so really the safe thing is uh, not to, not to poshka with that stuff at all, but if you're <laughs> going to serve it after it stops bubbling. So that's my, mm. that's my soapbox on that. That's a very helpful PSA. I wasn't even aware of, I mean, I also haven't yeah. touched that. So awesome. And right. I, I will say just one thing about now with Amazon fresh and mm -hmm. similar things, when they deliver cold items, a lot of times they deliver it with cold ice to keep with, with dry ice oh, really? to keep it cold. So it, it's mm. something that's becoming more accessible to people as well at home. Mm. Yikes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, in addition to those PSAs, David, thank you so much for sharing all this about the 
kosher cocktail enthusiast Facebook group and, and, and almost seemingly the trends in the last handful of years, really, when it comes to uh, kosher eaters and their interest in, in cocktails. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do you have anything you would like to promote beyond the Facebook group? Uh, no, not really. I have my, you know, I have side Nothing? projects and things, but uh, no, Nothing? I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll leave the focus on, on cocktails. Okay. Wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you thank so you. much. And I clearly have finished my white lady I'm, here. I'm almost there. All thank right. You. Thank you and for the opportunity. My p- absolute pleasure. And uh, with that, l'chaim. L'chaim.